Thank you, Richard, and good morning, everyone. Um, I am going to talk about natural gas, and I'm going to talk about natural gas and its role in the transition from where we are now, a fossil fuel dependent energy system, to a decarbonized energy system. And I think we all recognize the need to uh, transform the, uh, our energy economy. Uh, but the question is how we're going to get there. Now, when I talk about this, I usually talk about natural gas and its importance with respect to uh, greenhouse gas emissions and air pollution. I talk about you know, why we use hydraulic fracturing, uh, a term everybody knows today and most people fear. Um, and then I talk um, about the environmental impacts of how we're going to develop these tremendous resources while minimizing the environment. Uh, today, uh, Rob Jackson, uh, who's uh, recently joined the Stanford faculty, is going to follow me. And Rob is going to focus on issues related to environmental impacts. So all I'm going to talk about a little bit is uh, uh, the issue of earthquake triggering, which has gotten to be kind of a, a hot button issue as natural gas has been developed throughout parts of North America. Now, this is a slide which I, I got from Sally Benson. And I, I like to show this slide to uh, frighten students. And there are two parts of it. First part is that by the time you're about my age, which should be pretty frightening in and of itself, um, <laughs> there are several challenges you're going to be expected to have met. Now, global population you know, is uh, expected to stabilize at around 9, 9.5 billion by the mid-century. That's really good news. For most of my lifetime, that stabilization was never envisioned. Is there, it's just, and when you know, the population is kind of going up ex exponentially, it's hard to be optimistic. Um, so the population is expected to stabilize somewhere between 9 and 10 billion people. But the rising standard of living around the world is going to require about twice as much energy as we use today. So in this first half of the 21st century, we have to double the amount of energy we're providing while at the same time having a much smaller effect on the environment, respecting the need for economic growth and for and national security. So it's not an issue of rich countries, of North America, Western Europe, simply switching from dirty fuel to clean fuel it's a matter of doubling the size of the energy system in a way that's both environmentally sustainable, economically sustainable, and sustainable from the context of issues like energy security um, and societal acceptance. It's an enormous challenge. And, uh, and I hope uh, you're going to help make a big uh, contribution to meeting, meeting that challenge. Now, for the past seven years, my research group and I have been heavily involved in understanding the development of unconventional natural gas, shale gas, um, and its transition now. We've had you know, the shale gas revolution, and now we're having a, a revolution in oil production using horizontal drilling and multi-stage hydraulic fracturing. The energy picture in the United States has changed dramatically in less than 10 years. You know, the energy economy is one of the biggest things on Earth. And it has changed dramatically in less than a decade. And what's happened in North America is about to go global. It's already happening. And it's, it, there's nothing, nothing to stop it. So I'm sort of an upstream guy, trying to understand the reservoirs and try to understand how to develop the resources while minimizing the environmental impacts. And when I say it's going to go global, if we just excerpt the natural gas part of the story. And that's what I'm going to focus on right now. And we look at natural gas resources. And these are estimates. And, and uh, undoubtedly, they will all be wrong, hopefully not grossly wrong. But the, 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 the point of the slide is that the resource is enormous. Okay, uh, On the order of about 200 years of supply at something like 2010, 2012 consumption rates. Now, of course, if we use more natural gas than we were using at that time, which is our hope, then the supply lasts longer. But we're not going to be using fossil fuels for 200 years. 
hopefully 50 years from now, we're using almost no fossil fuels. And, and I think most people, you know, I, I serve on a science council, a high level science council for Shell. And they have a vision of how the energy industry is going to evolve from what it is today to a decarbonized energy industry. And Greenpeace has a vision of how the energy system is going to be decarbonized. And their visions are identical. An oil company and Greenpeace. But the time axis is different. <laughs> Shell thinks it's going to happen over 100 years. Greenpeace wants to see it happen over 50 years. Okay? But they share the vision, and that's the important thing. So how are we going to get from where we are to where we want to go? How do we manage the energy transition? That's, you know, I'd say the question, but of course it's a thousand questions um, that's involved. You all know from reading the paper that the economic benefits of this shale gas revolution have been huge. You know, one and a half million jobs, $200 billion to the economy. These are 2015 estimates by IHS, and uh, something like $50 billion of direct revenue to the federal and state governments. Now, I want to focus on using natural gas for electrical power generation and basically fuel switching from natural gas to coal. The only reason to use coal is because it's cheap and abundant. Right? It's a really, really dirty fuel in lots of different ways. Lots of CO2, lots of socks and knocks for air pollution, uh, particulates, which are a real problem, mercury, which is a real problem. And if we were to use natural gas, something we know how to do with highly efficient combined cycle natural gas plants, we can go a long way into cutting emissions, by half, reducing air pollution and reducing uh, the particulate and mercury problem um, in particular. And this has been known for a long time. And in fact, in the US, we see our uh, emissions in the electrical power sector reducing, right? They're down to like 1990 levels. And you know, uh, industrial production has still not recovered from the 2008 meltdown. We're almost back to where we were. Energy efficiency measures have become more and more important, and are, you know, there are, the positive effects are being felt. And we are, in fact, switching from coal to natural gas to the point where uh, they are producing comparable amounts of electricity today. And so the fuel switching is working. Now, let me just say a, a bit about these rocks. These rocks are, you know, these shale gas formations have been known forever. These are the source rocks from which hydrocarbons, all conventional hydrocarbons, have been derived. They're deposited in relatively deep water. So the way to think about this is that the phytoplankton and the marine organisms die, they fall to the bottom, they get buried in clay before they oxidize. And it traps the, the carbonaceous material. And over time, those, those little dead fossils turn into a waxy organic substance called kerogen. That kerogen is. Uh, then converted through mostly temperature to either oil or gas. It migrates out of the source rocks into a reservoir, and then geologists and geophysicists explore for these, uh, drill into them, and, and conventional oil and gas is produced. Now we're talking about going right into the source rocks themselves, not looking for these secondary reservoirs. So here's a, a photomicrograph of uh, the Eagleford Shale, which is a very active play in southern uh, Texas and continues on into Mexico. This lens here, that's, that's kerogen, okay? If we zoom in, you can start to see some pits. If we zoom in some more, those pits are actually the pores through which the natural gas flows, okay? And the result of the fact that the, this gas is flowing through such nanoscale pores, and these are actually kind of big compared to a lot of the other reservoirs, means that these rocks have a permeability, you know, the ease with which fluid moves through the rock, that's a million times smaller than a conventional reservoir. A million times, okay? And that's the challenge, and that's why they were never produced before. Um, they were known about, but we could never get out commercial quantities. And that's where hydraulic fracturing comes in. So this is uh, uh, produced by Halliburton. It's a schematic. It's um, horizontally exaggerated. These shales, the dark rock, the organic rich rock is typically a couple hundred feet thick. You drill through it. You find out where it is. 
They're, they're relatively flat lying. You drill a horizontal well. On average, these are about a mile long. You put some equipment down, down the well, and then you hydraulically fracture it, starting at what's called the toe and working your way back to the heel. So typically, this is a couple hundred feet. This is about a mile. And the hydraulic fracturing um, is done about 20 times per well. And these little dots represent very tiny micro-earthquakes, little slip events on pre-existing faults. And that is changing the permeability of this shale enough that we're producing, uh, able to produce uh, commercial quantities of, of natural gas. OK, so this is what the data look like. Um, here's a horizontal well um, in the uh, northeastern US. Just coincidentally, there was another horizontal well below it, and seismometers are there. The well was hydraulically fractured, in this case, about 10 times. And each of those little dots represents a microearthquake that was detected by the seismic instruments that are in the deeper well. Now, what is a microearthquake? Well, it's just like an earthquake. It's slipped on a fault. But these are magnitude minus two events, which means the fault that slips is less than a meter in size, and it slips about a tenth of a millimeter. So these are tiny little events. The amount of energy that's released is like a gallon of milk falling off a kitchen counter. So you would never even know this was happening if you did not put the seis seismometers down very close to where the action is occurring. So this is why we use hydraulic fracturing. The intrinsic permeability of the, well, of the, of the rocks are so low. And we do it a lot. In the last 10 years, there's been 150 thousand horizontal wells with multiple hydraulic fractures drilled in North America alone, which means you know, over, well over a million hydrofracks have been done. And the world has not come to an end, at least that I'm aware. OK. Now, when we look at some of these global distributions, it's really important to notice where the natural gas is. And the estimate is that there is a lot of recoverable natural gas in China. In fact, about the same as the US and Canada combined. Now, this is theoretically recoverable natural gas. Though there's certainly good challenges, challenges in China. The geology is more complicated. Water is a problem. Um, population density is high, so the development is impactful. Um, but nonetheless, the potential is huge. Argentina has a, a, the, the Vaca Muerta Formation, the Dead Cow Formation, which is just potentially enormous. South Africa provides coal to the African subcontinent uh, for electricity. It also potentially could produce natural gas, which is much cleaner, et, et cetera. So there's a lot of natural gas. It's globally distributed. And places like China are extremely important. So this shows. Uh, an estimate of China energy use 2008 to 2035. Uh, total energy is expected to double. The bar shows what you know, the source of the energy is. The gray bar is coal to match the color of the sky. Okay? And <laughs> in the United States, we produce about 2 billion tons of CO2 a year making electricity. In China, they produce 7 billion tons of CO2 per year making electricity. And if the US goes from 2 to 0, and China goes from 7 to 14, from a greenhouse gas perspective, it's sort of game over. Okay, So what we have to do is prevent you know, China from doubling its, its CO2 emissions associated with bur burning coal. And countries like India that are very dependent on coal, we have to provide alternative energy sources. Ideally. That's a very large component of renewables. It's a rebirth of nuclear. Okay? We want to do all of these things. But natural gas can play a role quickly, economically, as we transition to having a large fraction of non-carbon-based energy available. Okay? Here's Shanghai on a nice day. Um, 1.2 million premature deaths a year associated with respiratory disease largely related to coal. That's a, that's a lot of people dying. In the US, the estimate is that we're spending $60 billion on, on coal-related air pollution issues. And uh, <clears throat> you can make a fashion statement while you're wearing your face mask um, in China today. And 
you know, the potential is enormous, but the um, environmental impacts are also very significant. The development of shale gas is a large-scale industrial process. And like other large-scale industrial processes, it has to be done right, it has to be regulated right in order not to have a lot of negative effects. And you'll hear a, a lot more about that in the next talk. So, um, in fact, I'm just going to skip this. Okay, now one thing I do want to talk about are, are the triggered earthquakes, because they've been in the news a lot. Um, I was asked to write a paper for a, um, a magazine called Earth. It's sort of a semi-technical magazine uh, that's widely distributed to federal agencies and um, congressional staffers and, and the rest. Um, and, and the reason I was asked to write this is that Youngstown, Ohio, Guy, Arkansas, the Dallas-Fort Worth Airport area, and um, the Raton Basin in, uh, near the Colorado New Mexico border had all had earthquakes associated with fluid injection in the previous year. And since I wrote the paper, uh, it was argued that some in fact, sizable earthquakes in Oklahoma and then in a few places in Texas had all been triggered by earthquakes, uh, triggered by fluid injection, excuse me. So um, what's happening here? So um, in this kind of schematic illustration, we see the horizontal well going into shale. It's hydraulically fractured. You get these tiny little micro earthquakes. Very occasionally, out of the, you know, uh, Almost two million hydrofracks we've done, there have been about half a dozen cases in which the hydraulic fracturing itself has triggered an earthquake, the largest of which was magnitude three, which was meant it was felt, but you know, uh, was far below you know, the level at which any damage would be expected. So you get those micro earthquakes. After you do the hydraulic fracture, you flow the water back. And the water, you get about 25% of the water back. The water that comes back is very salty and has arsenic and selenium in it, and you have to dispose of it. And you use EPA uh, class two underground injection wells, which means it's you know, not super toxic, but you have to isolate it from the biosphere. And these injection wells then get rid of this wastewater. Now, uh, occasionally, one of these injection wells will hit a pre-existing fault zone and trigger an earthquake. So that, the earthquakes we're talking about are typically associated with the injection of the wastewater, not the hydraulic fracturing process itself. And in places like Pennsylvania, all of the flowback water, nearly all of the flowback water, is simply recycled. Okay, you, you get the water back, you put it in a tank, in a, a large pit which is lined and there's netting over the top, and then you gather up that water and you use it for hydraulic fracturing in the next well. So that's always a possibility. But where it's being injected, we're getting these earthquakes, and it's pretty straightforward to take some steps to minimize the risk. And I'll be in a conference next week with a few hundred people from the oil and gas industry just focused on that very, that very issue. Now, Oklahoma is in the news all the time. They have more earthquakes now of magnitude four and larger than California. Okay, this, this is a map of Oklahoma. The panhandle is over here. It's a little hard to see the state border. In blue, you see 34 years of earthquake activity, and in red, you see five years. The earthquake rate is up 40-fold, okay? And um, there are an awful lot of people who want to tell you that's due to hydraulic fracturing. So not only is it not due to hydraulic fracturing, it's not even due to the wastewater uh, from hydraulic fracturing. What's happening in Oklahoma is completely different. There is something called a dewatering play. And what they're doing is they're drilling horizontal wells, there's no hydraulic fracturing, into limestones that are 90% water and 10% uh, oil, okay? And a little bit of gas. And by pumping the water out, then the uh, oil comes um, out of the pores and into the larger fractures, and the natural gas comes out of solution, and they produce, in this case, a little bit of oil and a lot of natural gas, in this case, more oil and less natural gas, and the blue is lots of water. And it turns out that the great concentration of the earthquakes in Oklahoma, which is just north and east of Oklahoma City, are due uh, to this dewatering place. So all this um, means that we understand the process, and we, but we need to be proactively managing the processes, which is what we're not, we're not doing now. So just to conclude, 
the recognition of the importance of natural gas is now kind of widely understood. It's a huge resource. It has tremendous benefits if it's developed in a responsible manner. And we're starting a natural gas initiative here at the university. This uh, prospectus is going to be, be finished uh, in the next couple of days. And it involves everything from geomarkets and finance, the kinds of things that uh, Mark Thurber were just talking about, to upstream technology, and a very strong emphasis on environmental protection. And uh, the, you know, the whole issue is that the, enormous, the potential is enormous as long as the resource is developed in an environmentally responsible manner. Thank you very much. <laughs> Questions? Just a few. Um, on that chart that you had with the CO2 emissions from China, and it went from 70 to constant 14, what were the assumptions? Were there any assumptions that China will actually start using natural gas instead? Or how, how, is, how possible is it for China to actually not get to 14 in 2035? Um, so that, those bars were in that EIA, um, Energy Information Agency, report. So there are a series of assumptions. But the basic story was that the amount of coal being used was going to double. And that's where the 7 to 14 came. But they have a, you know, China is investing in renewables. China is investing in nuclear. So it's not just doubling business as usual, but the, the bottom line is coal is sort of being doubled al along the way. So is that kind of worst case scenario, or is that just the projection of what's likely happening? Um, well, uh, I think it's what they feel is the most likely thing to happen. Uh, but in my perspective, it kind of is a worst case scenario. Uh, you know, from, certainly from a, a greenhouse gas perspective. It's, it's a pretty uh, sobering potential. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Clemson is obviously a pretty small play. Do you worry about more, a bigger play like the Mississippi line that, you know, is a water heavy play too, having a similar effect? Miss, uh, Mississippi line play uh, is exactly the same kind of thing. It's in a different part of Oklahoma near the uh, Kansas border. And it is having exactly the same effect. There's a lot of seismicity there. We haven't been able to study it because the water injection data from the state is so badly organized and we don't have any data for 2013 or 2014 and a lot of the Mississippi Lime stuff was got going in 2012 and 2013. So not only is are these plays uh, causing the great majority of the problem, they're you know changing how the public perceives the problem and it it may not be po you know it may be it may not be possible to, to develop these dewatering plays. I mean, they may just have to get shut down, uh, or everybody, or everybody's gonna have to get earthquake insurance and just uh, be prepared for uh, more of the same. Yeah. Why is the, the shale revolution lagging so much international? For example, uh, some of the majors, I think in Poland, they, they drilled a lot of wells and they haven't had any of the success that they've had in the U.S. Is it maybe that the geology is just so different that some of the estimates you showed earlier, they might, they might not actually be realistic or, you know, what are the others? Are they political or? Well, you know, I, I think, you know, even if you cut the numbers in half, they're still awfully big, okay? And China... Uh, was fr everybody was frustrated with China because the potential was so high, the need was so high, and the progress was, excuse me, so slow. But China in the last six months have, has been reporting a lot of success. And part of the problem in China is everything is sort of controlled by the big national oil companies and they're all functioning under their five-year plan. And, you know, everything is just, you know, it's not the entrepreneurial, uh, uh, at, you know, it's not an entrepreneurial um, market, nor is there you know, a private sector oil and gas industry that can respond to opportunity quickly as there is in the United States. Another problem has to do with public acceptance. Um, you know, when the resource is owned by the federal government and you know, uh, the trucks are rolling through your, you know, through your town and there's nothing but noise, traffic, congestion, and headache, and you don't perceive any of the benefit, your attitude about this development is very different than when you know, you're, uh, you're participating in the upside. And, um, and so when you talk about Europe, you talk about the UK. 
you know, you have this lovely English countryside, right? And all people can see is the downside. And so, you know, coal, coal use is going, going up in the UK, sadly. So do you think we'll be able to replicate the US success abroad, you know, without, you know, there's no Texas oil men in Poland or the UK, I mean, is it, is it going to be possible? Well, the Texas oil men have passports, you know, and, uh, <laughs> um, and they're looking for opportunities everywhere. Look at Mexico with the big energy reform. The first thing Mexico will probably do is just buy a lot more natural gas from the US because it's cheaper to buy it than it is to develop it. But the evil food goes right into Mexico. So they have tremendous resources. And so it's all these complicated things related to supply and demand and all these other market factors you heard about. Right, right now, nobody's drilling for natural gas because dry gas, you know, you can't afford to make money on it, but we're getting so much associated gas by drilling the uh, liquid-rich systems um, that our gas production is still going up. So, you know, everything is moved geographically, but we, we still have 2,000 rigs operating in the United States, and, um, and our gas production is going up. And as, you know, markets, uh, you know, and demand goes up, the price will go back up, and then, um, uh, there'll be more gas drilling. I know that uh, currently in the U.S. doesn't have the infrastructure necessary to export natural gas. If we build that, even if China doesn't start drilling, could we help in that issue? Yeah, um, so there are a number of uh, LNG import terminals under construction uh, uh, until about five years ago, and then the construction sort of stopped, and now they're all being converted to export terminals. And uh, in... in um, Canada, there's a lot of natural gas um, in British Columbia and Alberta, and they're building a number of uh, export terminals on the West Coast for the Asian market. Um, there's been a fear that, um, well, the oil, U.S. oil companies are just going to export all this natural gas because they can get a lot more money for it in Asia than they can get, can get domestically. But a lot of people have been looking at this, and, you know, we just we have so much natural gas, you can't export all that much. And we don't, you know, once natural gas starts becoming a global commodity instead of a regional commodity, you know, we're then competing with South, you know, uh, there's a lot of natural gas coming out of Australia, uh, the the uh, east coast of Africa, um, and of course, you know, the Middle East itself. So, you know, some of these big differentials are going to uh, be abated by a global LNG market, but there's huge investments now in LNG export terminals, and the, the DOE has now approved, I know they've approved one or two, um, anyway, there are a bunch more pending applications, and we'll see more exporting, and it, and it, it shouldn't change things too much, at least from the talks um, I've heard. Last question. Go ahead. Can you explain more like some uh, technical difficulties to a natural gas and uh, shale gas in China? Like you mentioned, like water. The, okay. The, the, I think there are three technical difficulties in China. One is in places like the Sichuan Basin where a lot of this natural gas is, it's a geologically active area. So parts of it are more uh, deformed. You don't have these flat-lying shales where it's easy to drill a mile horizontally and stay within the shale unit. So that's something. Second is water. Uh, you don't have to use fresh water. It's easiest to use fresh water um, and to uh, you know, inject uh, the water that comes back. But you can use brackish. You can use salt water. Um, and recycle the water. So the water issues will add cost. And third is population density. You know, um, there, there are a lot of people living, you know, in, in the Sichuan Basin, and you have to carry out these operations in a populated area and make sure you do so in a way that's going to, you know, minimize the impact um, and do some good regional planning of the cumulative impacts over time. And all of this is going to, you know, increase, you know, the price of, of natural gas. But you know, we're paying something less than $4 a million BTU in North America. Japan now, that's shut down their nuclear industry, they're paying 20 okay? So there's a, there's a long way to go. You can double the cost of production compared to North America and still be relatively inexpensive, although you, you always got to beat coal. Thanks. <laughs>